anyway. You That's know, right. these fans say, you know, the movie is a little bizarre. There are some deep plot lines, but the Matrix fans say it's going to be great. Some people who saw sneak peek. Video games are a vital part of millions of people's day-to-day -day lives. We use them to distress, connect with others, entertain, and distract. Video games are so important that many people get completely lost and absorbed in them, getting lost in both the world of the games and the community. A video game that many of you have likely already heard of is The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. This was the first Zelda game to be released on the Game Boy back in 1993, and is the fourth game in the Legend of Zelda franchise. The game is a direct sequel to A Link to the Past and has Link getting shipwrecked during a storm where he is then found on the sands of an island and a new quest begins. The game is famous or infamous in some circles for the ending it presents. Now this is a spoiler for a game that came out 30 years ago, but if you still want to skip it, here's the timestamp. In the end, through context clues in the game, as well as a prophecy, you find out that the island isn't real. It's an illusion created by the dream of the windfish. In order for Link to leave the island, he needs to wake up the windfish. If he does this, he will cease the illusion, but he will also erase everyone that Link has met and befriended on his journey. The idea that reality is an illusion, a video game, or a computer simulation is the thought behind the very popular Matrix Theory. The Matrix Theory was popularized by the movie franchise, which is also where it gets its name but actually existed before in another form and name. This theory was called the simulation theory. The simulation theory has existed for decades, but the point of origin that most point to comes from a Swedish philosopher named Nick Bostrom. In 2003, Bostrom submitted a paper titled, Are You Living in a Computer Simulation? A paper whose title gives you most of the context you need. The paper discusses three main ideas for how our reality could in fact just be that of a computer simulation. But the most compelling idea is the ancestral simulation thesis. This theory is the basis for many that believe in both the simulation and matrix theories. The basis of this hypothesis is that an advanced civilization referred to as afterhumans are so technologically advanced that they are able to create whole realities inside of computers. These hyper-advanced people then create ancestor simulations in order to test certain theories. This idea is expanded upon by a New York University philosophy professor named David Chalmers. Chalmers claims that it could be a higher being that has created our universe, or it could be just a teenager running multiple simulations in the background. Either way, they are more advanced than us and are realistically similar to that of a deity. The ancestral simulation theory postulates that any number of worlds can be created, for any number of reasons. We might exist simply for a scientist to test what would happen if mosquitoes existed, or it could be as complex as how the earth would change and grow if it were mostly made of water. This theory makes a multitude of possibilities well, possible. The ancestral simulation theory builds into the multiverse theory, where any number of possible worlds can exist. Similar multiverses can be running in the simulation alongside our own, and could have intermixed or been changed by the creators at any time. Our universe is a simulation after all, one that can be changed by a simple switch up of the code. This has also led to the rise in popularity of the clickbait pseudoscience of the Mandela effect. I covered this topic in part one of this series, so I won't be going too in depth here. The Mandela Effect in this context refers to a belief that something that we collectively remember is now different. Something as simple as Kit Kat having a dash in the middle between Kit and Cat, which isn't true. This is mostly people having fun with memory or misremembering things, but there are those that heavily believe in it as well. For those that believe, one specific theory they point to is the multiverse theory. That theory then can wrap around into the simulation theory. Of course, the simulation theory is more of a philosophical theory than a scientific one. The man that popularized it is a philosophy major, and many that have added to it have been the same. In fact, there is no basis in science for this theory as of now. The closest the simulation theory comes to science is with the use of math. Math can be found in just about every part of our reality. And some have used this to state that our world is not too dissimilar to a computer, which can mean that our reality is a computer, a very advanced supercomputer capable of creating a universe. The premise of the simulation theory is actually not too far off from philosophical ideas that have been asked for centuries. Namely, what is reality? A quote from theoretical physicist David Bohm reads, Reality is what we take to be true. What we take to be true is what we believe. What we believe is based upon our perceptions. What we perceive depends on what we look for. What we look for depends on what we think. What we think depends on what we perceive. What we perceive determines what we believe. What we believe determines what we take to be true, and what we take to be true is our reality. 
A person's perception then becomes their reality. If someone perceives themselves as the most attractive person in the world, then that becomes their reality. Of course, how others react to them also shapes that reality. If no one believes them, then that too will become their reality. Philosophers have been theorizing that reality is an illusion for a while. Works like Butterfly Dream by Zhuang Zhu or Allegory of the Cave by Plato. These both paint reality as something that can be changed and may not even exist at all. Reality is often compared to a kind of sleep or madness. Of course, there's far more to these philosophical ideas than what I stated here. Most of this is important when we look into the internet's interpretation of the simulation theory, which is the matrix theory. As I've stated before, this theory mainly comes from the movies from which it takes its name. The matrix theory was popularized online sometime in the early 2000s, but the exact origin is hard to find. Where most people will likely know the matrix theory is through Reddit and 4chan. The prior has the wildly popular Glitch in the Matrix subreddit. This subreddit is home to every theory about our reality being a simulation that you could want to find. It was created in 2012 and the bio reads, I witness events that cannot be explained with critical thinking. This subreddit also popularized a different version of the simulation theory and instead of philosophical quandaries, focuses mainly on weird happenings in reality. These weird happenings usually pointed to the simulation having glitches, thus the name. This would become the most popular version of the theory that exists online. There are thousands of posts here as the subreddit boasts a massive 997k members. The most uploaded post comes from user Squirrels Mock Me, and the post is titled, My 5 year old son broke character and talked to me like an adult. The post reads, This happened about 2 years ago and I was so blown away I took notes and told my wife about it, so I still have the notes on my phone. My 5 year old son was pretty typical for his age, always goofing around, never serious, always working some kind of angle to negotiate treats or buying whatever thing was at the top of his list this week. Kids have a selfish worldview, and that's mostly understandable because they haven't matured yet. So when my son asked me to go for a walk with just the two of us, I immediately laughed and thought, okay, what's he going to ask for? We started walking and I asked, what's on your mind, buddy? He said, nothing really, I just want to have some time to be with you and be peaceful and be out in nature. Wow, okay, this is progress, I thought. Then he said, I want you to know you're the best dad I've ever had. You really do help me and my sister a lot, and you're really very nice even though we don't usually tell you. So I just wanted to say thank you for everything, and I want to be near you always. By this point, the only reason I wasn't completely crying my eyes out is that I thought it was some kind of a joke or a lead up to ask for something. This was totally out of character, especially at his age. I managed to croak out something like, I'm really glad to hear that and I love you very much. Then we just enjoyed the rest of the walk. It really felt like for a moment I was speaking to a soul who had several lives and wanted to speak directly to me instead of playing the role of a child. I'm so glad it happened and it's something I will never forget. Later he went back to being the same old goofy kid that I love. This is a pretty typical post for this subreddit and the comments are what you'd expect. The entire comment section for this thread is all people claiming that their children have also said things that were completely out of character for children. One comment says that their child always proclaimed they liked it better when they were the mom. Another says they cried near a 9-11 monument and made claims that their feet were hot before they jumped. The subreddit has some of the craziest and most interesting stories that the whole website has to offer. You could spend hours reading personal accounts, seeing images that are hard to explain, or watching videos of weird happenings. Glitch in the Matrix would even become a popular YouTube series for content creators to read these stories. Within this community, there are even entirely different rabbit holes to explore. A popular topic is the idea of experiencing one's own death and then waking up from it back in reality. A post from user liquidgold83 is titled, I died last night but I'm still here, and it reads, So this actually happened last week. It just took me some time to come to terms with it. I got a phone call from my next door neighbor late in the evening, asking if I could help him move a mattress into his upstairs. His mom is ill and has a big heavy sleep number bed. I of course ran over to help because they're great neighbors. I got over there and his friend, who is also a priest, was there to help. I helped them figure out how to separate the mattress from the bed so we could fit it upstairs. We get it all moved up and back in place when my neighbor asks if I can help them move an armoire upstairs too. I think nothing of it and we pull it out of his travel trailer and start bringing it up the front stairs of his house. This is where I died. The front stairs are 11 steps. I was on the lower end of the armoire about 6 steps up when my neighbor and his friend lost a handle on the armoire and it came crashing down on me. And I fell backwards towards the pavement. I then woke up in my dining room to my phone ringing and my wife asking me if I'm going to answer the phone. It's my neighbor asking if I can help move a bed upstairs for his mom. 
I go over there and meet his priest friend again, as this has been the first time I met him. I say I can help with the bed, but I can't help with the armoire. My neighbor was like, how'd you know about the armoire? I then proceed to tell them I'm pretty sure I just died. I spent the next hour talking with the priest. He had so many questions. My neighbor didn't believe it until I described the upstairs bedroom in perfect detail, down to the metal mattress frame on the floor and the intricate headboard leaning against the wall, and I had never been upstairs in their house before. The priest asked me what I saw after I died. I told him I never actually died. Before it happened, I woke up at my dining room table. These stories are pretty common, and the comments section is filled with others saying how they restarted their simulation by dying. This phenomenon actually has its own name. It's called Quantum Immortality, which is another rabbit hole that can be explored further at a different time. Glitch in the Matrix is also used for every coincidence you can imagine. It's a solid enough sub for those that just want to see what people might consider odd in our world. It's also chock full of stories that you could easily spend hours browsing through. Glitch in the Matrix is also the name of a documentary that was released in 2021. It's a documentary that I'd say that doesn't do a very good job of covering what the Matrix or simulation theory is really about. It mainly focuses on the thoughts of three random believers in the Matrix. Most of the connections they try to make aren't realistic in any way. One guy says that he started noticing similarities in his schedule and that they were clearly works of the Matrix. Another person takes it a different direction and says they discovered the Matrix while at church as a child. These don't really bring anything new to the Matrix theory conversation and kind of makes others likely not to want to research it for themselves. The unrelated antidotes from each speaker kind of makes it seem like pseudo intellectuals that see themselves as main characters. This is a term I've seen a lot called main character syndrome. They state that there are a certain number of people in the simulation that are player characters, themselves mainly, and then there are NPCs that inhabit the world alongside us. This theory does have a few believers, but most aren't conceited enough to think that they are the main character. There is one more section though that I thought is very important to discuss. The nihilism that comes from the Matrix theory. It goes like this. Some that believe so heavily in the idea that we're in a simulation or a video game that they start not to respect reality. They start to treat others like NPCs or that they aren't real and their actions don't matter. This nihilism comes from the feeling that if everything around you isn't real, then your actions have no consequences. This is probably the darkest element to the matrix or simulation theories. Someone could use it to justify any action they feel like taking. Why does it matter? The world isn't real anyway. This line of thinking has gone to its logical worst case scenario already. A murder was committed in 2003 by a teen named Joshua Cook. He murdered his parents in the basement of their home. During his defense, the teen was told that he solemnly believed that he was in the matrix and that his actions didn't matter since reality wasn't real. This defense didn't save him from jail time, but it wasn't really supposed to. That is just what he believed. The Matrix Theory just confirmed whatever dark and twisted view of reality he already had. Even so, the Matrix Theory is more or less that, a theory. It's fun to think about, but not something that you could ever prove. That's because, as philosophy professor Preston Green puts it, if our physicists were to prove that we live in a simulation, it could be catastrophic for our reality. This is because if we figured out we were part of a simulation, then those running it would see no need to keep it running, as it would no longer be useful. He says, it would be a quick and painless death. They would likely just unplug us and move on. This is the dark reality of the consequences of the simulation theory, or at least as he sees it. This could be a dissuading factor for many that would want to prove this theory. Though, I doubt we'll get any answers to that anytime soon. The Matrix Theory is an interesting part of internet culture that I don't see being abandoned anytime soon. What do you feel when you look at this image? How about if I add in the sound of the lights above buzzing in the way that old office lights do? Do you feel nostalgic in a way? Does this remind you of being a child walking through an empty office building or maybe through an old Sears building? Maybe you feel a little anxious, or unsure. Maybe you feel horrified, but in a way you can't quite put into words. This image set off an entire new genre of horror for the internet. The vaguely nostalgic horror that it imprinted on those that saw it is still common today. In 2009, the internet was haunted by the Slender Man, a tall faceless entity that kidnapped children, teens, and young adults, and did who knows what to them. In 2019, the internet was haunted by a new entity, one by the name of the back rooms. In 
It's not often that a piece of internet lore will have the popularity or staying power that things like Slenderman, FNAF, and Siren Head have. The Backrooms is just another internet creepypasta that blew past its target audience and into the mainstream, with mountains of fanworks, games, and even ARGs set around that initial image. But where do the Backrooms originate from? The original post was made on 4chan, where many of the internet's darkest pieces of lore are derived. The image I mentioned before was posted in a thread with the caption, disquieting, haunting images that just feel off. Not long after, another user commented a narrative to go along with the image. If you're not careful and you noclip out of reality in the wrong areas, you'll end up in the back rooms, where it's nothing but the stink of old moist carpet, the madness of mono yellow, the endless background noise of fluorescent lights at maximum hum buzz, and approximately 600 million square miles of randomly segmented empty rooms to be trapped in. God save you if you hear something wandering around nearby, because it sure as hell has heard you. The comment mentions no clipping, which is a very common phrase used in video games. It means to phase through something essentially, usually a wall, and into a place you're not supposed to be. This set up the idea that you could simply be walking and accidentally fall through the world and into this dimension. There you would find these endless halls and a most haunting realization that there's no way out. Trapped, afraid, and likely not alone. The text and image would then be attached together and begin to spread across X, and eventually made its way off of 4chan altogether. It would end up on Reddit, and this is where the mainstream internet would take it as its own. This is the start of the internet's newest obsession, the backrooms. The post and image were two completely different things that got morphed together to make a microfiction. This is one of the most popular ways that creepypastas are created. This is, in fact, a creepypasta showing that with a good enough idea, the medium is truly inseparable from the world of internet horror. The spread of the story would be quick, as it gained popularity on Reddit and TikTok. On Reddit, there was a sub created simply titled The Backrooms. The sub is currently sitting at 267,000 members, with thousands of posts per day. The most upvoted posts are usually memes relating to The Backrooms, the additional lore of The Backrooms, and anything else that relates, horror or not. For those that preferred the more haunting aspects of The Backrooms, another sub was created. This one was called True Backrooms. This sub focused on the original image and spread of the story. It didn't want to focus on the memes or the plethora of additional lore that the internet had concocted for the backrooms. They preferred to focus on what made the original image disturbing. The feeling of not knowing what exactly the backrooms are and why exactly they give us all anxiety and trepidation when looking at them. The true horror of the backrooms relates to another popular topic on the internet, that being liminal spaces. Liminal spaces can be defined as an internet aesthetic portraying empty or abandoned places that appear eerie, forlorn, and often surreal. Liminal spaces are commonly places of transition, pertaining to the concept of liminality, or of nostalgic appeal. Liminal spaces can be just about anything with that definition. Some of the most common are empty train stations, empty schools and classrooms, abandoned malls, and playgrounds or daycares after closing. The feeling of loneliness, eeriness, and a forlorn sense of nostalgia or make this topic such a big hit on the internet. The internet loves nostalgia and horror. Mixing the two is what makes so many interested in liminality. Liminal spaces are a topic and rabbit hole all their own, but knowledge of what they are is important for knowing why the backrooms became so popular. The image invoked that feeling of forlorn, haunting nostalgia. It would be what carried it to everything else it would become. The backrooms weren't done growing. In fact, this was just the beginning of that growth. A series was created on YouTube titled The Backrooms, Found Footage. This series would go on to become the most viewed piece of Backrooms media. The initial video sits at 49 million views on YouTube. This was an analog horror series of sorts and starts with a cameraman that accidentally ends up in the Backrooms. This series would get 16 plus videos, all garnering a decent amount of viewership. The series was created by a 16 year old from Northern California named Kane Parsons. His series stands as the most popular use of the creepypasta. It would even be announced that a movie was being created based on his version of the story. Whether this movie will be able to live up to the hype of the original story and image is up for debate, but many are hopeful, myself included. The inspiration wouldn't stop there though, as there were a multitude of games to release with the Backrooms as their premise. The first one worth talking about is the Backrooms game by Pie on a Plate Productions. This was the first Backrooms game I played, and I even made a video on it back in 2019. Backroom Games plays it very straight and has you exploring the nearly identical halls of an empty office building. The sounds of your footsteps and hum buzz of the lights above are the only things that will accompany you. The atmosphere really captures what made the original story so intriguing, especially since you can escape the back rooms or an entity can find you first. 
Another game is the popular co-op game, Inside the Backrooms. This version of the Backrooms has you trying to escape the titular location with up to four players. The goal remains the same regardless of player count. Solve the puzzles, avoid the entities, and escape. There are a lot of Backroom games worth mentioning, but one look through Steam is all you need. So many games were inspired by the story and could easily become a genre of their own. In fact, they might do that in the same vein that Slender Games became the norm in horror for a while. Of course, with any popular piece of internet lore, it was bound to get expansions to its initial lore and premise. The Backrooms may have started out with that single image and insinuation of dangerous entities, but now there's a whole wiki about it. The Backrooms wiki is a very expansive place, like the Backrooms themselves. Here, thousands of creators have added to the lore of the original. This includes new levels, as they call them, new entities, and more. If we start with the levels, we find that there are different types. There are the standard levels, this includes level 0, which is the office building that we all know, and continues into the thousands. Level 0 is named the lobby, and is likely where most start their descent into the back rooms. Here's the description from the wiki. Level 0 is an expansive, non-Euclidean space, resembling the back rooms of a commercial building. All rooms in level 0 share the same superficial features, such as worn mono-yellow wallpaper, old moist carpet, scattered electrical outlets, and inconsistently placed fluorescent lighting. Aside from these common features, no two rooms within the level are identical in layout. The fluorescent lighting in level 0 hums at a constant frequency. This buzzing is notably louder and more obtrusive than ordinary fluorescent lights. An examination of the fixtures to determine the source has proven inconclusive. Additionally, the fluid saturating the carpet cannot be consistently identified. It is not water, nor should it be consumed. Linear space in level 0 is altered drastically. It is possible to walk in a straight line, return to the starting point, and end up in a completely different set of rooms than the ones previously traversed. Due to this phenomenon, the visual similarity between each room, consistent navigation of level 0 has proven very difficult. Devices such as GPS locators and compasses fail to function within the level and radio communications are audibly distorted, and often prove unreliable. Above the ceiling tiles in level zero lies a cramped, dark space, roughly one meter in height. The air in this area is stale and thick with dust, making it difficult to breathe, and electrical wires line the ceiling in all directions. Attempting to use this space as a means of navigation is impractical, as the ceiling tiles easily give way under pressure. The most prominent threat in level zero is the stark lack of available resources, as the fluid saturating the carpet has been deemed unsafe for human consumption. Most are likely to perish before managing to find an exit due to extended dehydration, starvation, and exhaustion. This was a drastic expansion of the source material. No longer was this just an image that could be anything, now is this space made up of infinite space. One they could get lost in forever. One that has no discernible threats, other than being trapped with no resources. This is just the tip of what is available on the wiki. One can't escape level 0, but would immediately end up in level 1. Described as Habitable Zone 1, with the monikers of Safe, Stable, and Minimal Entity Encounter. This is described as the true starting point of the back rooms. The description says it is a massive warehouse with concrete floors and walls, exposed rebars, dim fluorescent lights placed on the walls, and a low-hanging fog with no discernible source. This area is listed as habitable because it has a consistent water supply and electricity. Level 1 is considered far more expansive than 0, with staircases, elevators, isolated rooms, and hallways. There are also paintings and drawings on the walls that appear at random intervals, and then disappear without warning. Level 1 is where the entities start to appear. This includes entities called facelings, which are the most common in the back rooms. These entities resemble humans, only their faces are missing key parts. Most facelings have no features whatsoever, meaning no nose, no eyes, and no mouth. Others have some of their features, but only missing the nose, or one eye, or just the mouth. Another entity on this floor, and the one that sounds most terrifying, are hounds. This is the description of hounds. Hounds are humanoid entities with canine attributes. They have unkempt black hair on their heads, and large mouths filled with sharp teeth. They have long bony limbs, sharp claws, have eyes that are fully white, lacking irises or pupils, and walk on all fours like a dog, hence their name. They are some of the most common hostile entities found in many levels of the back rooms but are less common in the deeper levels. Hounds sound very similar to many different entities, including some descriptions of the Wendigo. Aside from the standard levels, there are also the negative levels. These levels start with negative one and go down to negative 1000. These levels appear to be more unsafe than those of the standard levels. Level negative one is a long hallway that appears to have no end. Negative one also happens to make a copy of itself for everyone who enters, meaning that there will likely never be two people on the same level. 
Occasionally the hallway will come to a dead end or an intersection. These may appear sporadically or all at once. This makes the hallways hard to navigate as you have to just keep moving. Entities on this floor are the two we mentioned before, plus a new one called a skin stealer. Skin stealers, as described by the wiki, are large humanoid entities that are commonly known to wear the skin of their victims as a disguise, which makes them rather difficult to identify. They are commonly observed to have the ability of mimicking human speech, albeit very inadequately. It is highly suggested to run away from any wanderer who seems to be repeating the same words or speaks in a monotone voice. There is a rumor that has been circling around for many years that they are able to identify a skin stealer by the color of its blood. Whilst humans possess red blood, skin stealers possess clear blood. Although this rumor was proven true by an unknown group, it is heavily advised to focus on the other signs and not this. For any method that exposes the blood, i.e. stabbing, shooting, or by any explosive, would likely cause an instance of this entity to charge and destroy the attacker at alarming speeds. Skin stealers appear to have similar attributes to creatures from folklore. Human mimicry is something that we saw earlier with skinwalkers, wendigos, and the goatman, and several other creatures. Regardless, these are some of the most common entities that can be seen on just about every level of the backrooms. They are almost as common as facelings and 10 times more aggressive. Another section are the anomalous levels, which are described as enigmatic or oddball levels. They don't really fit in with the other levels and hold a special kind of mystery all their own. One of the reasons is the lack of knowledge about how they operate. They are considered otherworldly rather than liminal. The final level tab is dimensions. Dimensions are usually used to define realities, room spaces, or superclusters. This section includes the front rooms, which is our reality. It also includes the back rooms, which is the entirety of all the levels clustered under one name. Then there is the broken. When clicking on it, it shows this. Warning, this document is partially corrupted. The following text may contain an error or distorted data. Proceed at your own risk. Opening the document, you are presented with this. The description reads, the appearance of the broken is kaleidoscopic and modeled. Its architecture and layout do not follow any logical spatial structures. Its terrain, as it may be called, is stretched and twisted into shapes that are difficult to grasp. Refractions of light seem to emanate from everywhere and nowhere, imprinting upon the landscape. There is no order to the fluctuating patterns of colors and incomprehensible geometric shapes that flicker in and out of the broken, splintered plane of existence. The fabric of its reality appears to be shattered as far as the eye can discern. Terrain and even light itself falls into distortion. Objects of higher dimensions phase in and out of the broken's contorted, polychromatic landscape, tearing one apart upon contact, with every last bit of hypothetically processable data flowing through them at once. Its environment is deafeningly loud, a discordant cacophony of non-sensorial tones and howling frequencies without a direct origin. The broken appears to be an area outside of the already reality warping back rooms. This area is unlivable and appears to do something for the back rooms, but it isn't explained what that means exactly. The broken can even be the final place someone descends to before blinking out of existence entirely. This is but the surface of the world building lore that the back rooms community has done so far. The level list is insane and mirrors differing fears that the writers felt compelled to add. This collaborative writing project mirrors another with similar levels of quality and world building that being the SCP Foundation. So many creatives are coming together to add to the mysterious lore that can expand forever. As the space itself is endless, so too are the ideas that can be projected onto it. For as many answers as the wiki tries to give, there are as many that we can never have. The true meaning behind the backrooms can never be explained. Even with this wiki creating lore for something that was scary without it, I don't really see a reason they can't expand the lore. I do find the scariest ideas are that which have no answers, like H.P. Lovecraft's creations and the many other formless, unknowable entities. That doesn't mean that expanding the unknown is taking away from what we originally started with. This whole fascination started with one image and a paragraph of text. The simple act of its existence is haunting enough, but the fact that it has more to offer is telling of the interest it has created. The Backrooms is likely to go the way of Slenderman and Siren Head, but who knows? It could just be the next SCP Foundation. It's late at night and you're lying alone in your bedroom. Your eyelids are heavy, but something keeps dragging you away from sleep. You close your eyes, then you open them. Something feels heavy in the air. Suddenly you don't feel like you're alone anymore. You look around your room and there is something there. A vague shape of a man stands in the corner. His body is completely shadowed, even against the complete darkness of your room. Somehow he stands out completely. You look closer, still feeling groggy, and notice something. He appears to be wearing a wide-brimmed hat or perhaps a fedora. 
He has a long trench coat to match. The figure never moves, just stays completely still, as if he's waiting for you to do something. You can't though, you're frozen with fear. The figure finally moves, but not towards you. Rather, he moves towards the door and leaves, almost as if he was never there in the first place, gone like a phantom in the night. This encounter is one shared by millions of people across the world. The name of this entity is one you might have heard of. He's called the Hat Man. The name may sound kind of silly, but it was given for his obvious choice in attire. The Hat Man is an entity that has been reported since the 90s, though there are reports from the 80s that were shared in that following decade. The true origin of this entity isn't fully known, as legends and myths similar to him have existed for centuries. The Hat Man is said to be a shadow person that appears in people's rooms during the dead of night. He usually appears when a person is in that limbo state between sleep and wakefulness, or when they just woken up in the middle of the night. The Hat Man is reported to mostly just observe the sleeping person. He doesn't move towards them, doesn't attack them, just watches. For this reason, many have considered the Hat Man to be more curious than dangerous, though it is still considered safer to just not interact with him. It's also believed that the Hat Man can come in moments when people are experiencing sleep paralysis. Many people have reported seeing the Hat Man in their rooms during these episodes. A lot of these reports also state that the Hat Man was with another sleep paralysis demon known as the Hag an old woman that reportedly sits on people's chests. Many civilizations and cultures have had their own variant of the Hat Man, or a being that comes in and keeps you in sleep paralysis. The Egyptians had the Jinn, an evil genie that was the cause of their sleep paralysis. Another is the Mare, which originates from Scandinavian folklore. Many similar stories have been told from all parts of the world. As for online, the Hat Man came to prominence on the internet around 2008, thanks to the blog titled The Hat Man Project. This blog was created by a man named Timothy M. Brown Jr. In it, he describes his encounters with the Hat Man and how he has become a major factor in his life, as is documenting cases where individuals have also seen him. The blog is a section where anyone can send in their encounters and is even updated to August of 2023. This is likely due to the uptick in Hat Man sightings being reported online. The first sighting is from the creator of the website himself, where he also explains his fascination with the entity. In 1994, Timothy was 14 years old. He was living with his grandmother and great-grandmother in Nashville, Tennessee. He was in bed one night, nodding off while watching TV. The room's only light came from that same TV. His bedroom door was open, and from there he could see into the dark hallway. As he lay there, between sleep and wakefulness, he saw a shape moving. The figure was described as the same as every other hat man encounter. He had a wide-brimmed hat and a trench coat. The man peered into his grandmother's room and then moved to look in on his great-grandmother. He stayed silent and kept his eyes mostly closed thinking it was an intruder. The man moved out of view, and this is when Timothy decided to get up and yell at the intruder. Of course, all this did was wake up his family. The man was gone, like he'd never been there in the first place. He asked his grandma and great-grandma about it the next day, and they too said they saw some shape or figure moving around the house that night, and other nights. This, along with his fascination with shadow people, inspired him to start his research into the Hat Man in 2001. He compiled hundreds of stories from witnesses from all over the world, he tried to find some online, but in 2001, the internet was a less reliable source of information, and no one seemed to have heard of the Hat Man at all. The website is host to many stories related to the Hat Man, and is still getting entries to this day. One of the stories is about a woman claiming to have seen the Hat Man while having her son examined at a hospital. She claimed that the Hat Man, or some demon, had entered the room where her child was being examined by the doctor. Her son was terminal, but after that day, he had a new lease on life. Unfortunately, she believes that he was possessed that day. He grew up to be a bully, drug addict, and a plague to all that knew him. She believes that this was the Hat Man's doing. She believes that her son was meant to die that day, but that the Hat Man had other plans for him. This story clearly doesn't follow any of the other sightings with the Hat Man, but is only one of the thousands of stories posted to the blog. Another story has two men that saw the Hat Man along a lake one night. They were on their way home from a get-together when two of the three men saw him on the shoreline. The Hat Man walked along the lake. When he would walk by a light, he would still appear as a shadow. Nothing would illuminate him. When they pointed out the figure to their other friend, he disappeared. The next day, the two witnesses had learned that the body of an old man had been found in the lake. This encounter seems to claim that the Hat Man either caused or predicted this fate. I couldn't find an article or anything attached to the story, so I don't know if it was foul play or not. If indeed it was, then the Hat Man could be considered dangerous or as a kind of ill omen. There are hundreds of stories about various sightings of the Hat Man. Most follow the original sighting to a T. The Hat Man is a recurring nighttime fixation. Sometimes he arrives to haunt their nightmares, and sometimes he's just a passing figment. All too many times, though, he's just there to keep them from sleeping. A living embodiment of insomnia. 
Of course, this blog wasn't the only place to see the Hat Man. His popularity online would take off a few years after the blog went live. 2009 to 2014 saw a rise in online searches for the Hat Man. Many of these were people trying to figure out what they had witnessed themselves. 4chan had a thread dedicated to the Hat Man. In the thread, they discuss what the Hat Man might be. There are even a few Anons sharing their stories with the Hat Man. One Anon wrote, In the house I used to live in, the door to the backyard would swing open because the handle was a piece of garbage. So for years I joked with my siblings that the man is coming in, to greet him at the door. And one night I woke up to hear the door opening and went to go grab it before the house stood cold. I saw a silhouette of a tall man standing in the door. The moon was outside and the area was decently well lit around him, but he was pitch black. It just stood there and sort of just faded away. The memory was unnerving and really stuck with me. Another writes, I had an encounter when I was a kid, as did my sister. Possibly the same night, my memory is poor. He had a taller hat than the image, and a longer cloak. I remember waking up in the middle of the night to him, it, looking down on me. We, my sister and I, slept on a futon on the ground. We called it an electric carpet. It was winter and my family preferred these things to turning the heat on. My sister told me about it the next day. My parents never believed us, and I don't think my sister even believes it happened anymore. Then again, I'm not sure either. It was night, and we could have been dreaming, or I could be taking her dream, or vice versa, as my memory, having never seen it myself. In any case, it still spooks me out a bit. Much of the thread is recounting these tales. A minority of it is discussing the difference between a shadow person and the hat man, and one person asks the most important question of all, just what the hell is stored in our collective psyche to mass hallucinate the same thing? The hat man has been seen much before the internet was used for mass communication. Somewhere deep in our human psyche, this being has existed. These sightings all share similar trends as well. So what exactly is it that people are all seeing? And how is it the same thing from person to person? Sleep paralysis isn't the only way people are experiencing the hat man. The more well-known or infamous way is through the abuse of hallucinogens. You've probably seen this image before. It was all over Twitter for a minute. It's a pretty funny post, but it also brings to light a very common occurrence. Those that abuse hallucinogens have reported seeing the hat man on many occasions. It started happening so much that it became a meme to look out for him if you were to partake. Reports have talked about the things you might see while high, but the hat man has taken prominence above all the others. What is it about the hat man that has made him so prevalent in these drug-fueled nightmares? Other shadow men have also been reported, but little compared to the hat man himself. A hypothesis that was put out by a few users over the years is that the hat man is in some way connected to childhood trauma. Those that have reported seeing the hat man have had worse childhoods than those that haven't. There isn't an exact study done on this yet, but a majority of stories from those that have seen the hat man come from broken homes or tumultuous households. This exact idea was spread through TikTok, where the hat man has become increasingly popular since 2022. Like with many other trends that have circulated around the internet, TikTok finally found it and is making it popular again. A TikTok account by the name of Heart Start Pounding has one of the most watched hat man videos at 3.4 million views. The next three Hatman videos all sit in the millions of views. The first video goes over the stuff we've already covered, but focuses on the side of the Hatman being a sleep paralysis demon. Another TikTok by the handle of Abby Sabata puts forth the idea that the Hatman could be a parasite. He feeds off the negative emotions of children who are experiencing trauma. This would then follow them into adulthood. Whatever the Hatman truly is, we'll likely never know. The closest thing we have to any research being done on the entity is the book that the author of the blog is currently working on. With him conducting research since 2001, it's likely we'll see some interesting finds come out in his book. Until then, watch your corners closely. The Hat Man could be watching. It all started in October of 2020. A seemingly innocuous video was uploaded to YouTube. One of the 2,500 videos uploaded every minute to the website. This one was unique to say the least. The video is of something in Mario Party DS, a game that many of us probably played growing up. At 40 seconds, the video is not very long. It starts with a mini game involving Mario, Luigi, Wario, and Yoshi. The audio quality is bad and the footage is pixelated. 10 seconds in and a pop-up comes up on screen. It goes by very quickly, but it reads, exception occurred. Please turn off the power and destroy the game card. Another message flies by. Software piracy detected. You are in possession of an illicit copy of this title. Please turn off the power immediately. As these messages are crowding the bottom screen of the DS, the audio has also glitched. The game appears to freeze and the screen goes black. It isn't for very long though, 
as this now covers the screen. Piracy is no party, it reads, followed by, it is a serious crime to pirate video games. Please power off the system and report this stolen software immediately. Mario and the others are all trapped behind bars while this song plays. This is the Mario Party DS anti-piracy screen, and well, something about it just feels ominous. Could it be the characters from our childhood all behind bars? Maybe it's the way the music is playing in the background. For me, it's the threatening message on screen that really does it. Seeing this screen seems like a threat from Nintendo, something they've handed out to their fans before, especially with the link to the website just below the message. The music and image work together terrifically to create this feeling of you shouldn't have done that. This is the first video in a series that would appear on YouTube as anti-piracy screens for video games would become massively popular as this video would go viral. The original video is sitting at 1.3 million views as of the recording date for this video, with a few sequel videos all sitting around the same viewership. This would bring in a wave of anti-piracy videos, any game could be included, from Mario and Sonic to Minecraft and Fortnite. Any and all games were given these screens with seemingly no limit. I want to look at a few of these anti-piracy screens together. Starting with Sonic the Hedgehog Secret Anti-Piracy Screen. This is a good starting point, I feel, as it shows an important aspect of this trend. In order to access the anti-piracy screen, you need to input a code. The game requires you to play certain in-game sound effects in order, and then select Green Hill Zone. The game starts out how it normally would and you need to play it normally. Eventually you need to turn around and run in the opposite direction. At the beginning of this stage will be a bonus stage ring. Jump into it. The sound corrupts and then you're brought to this screen. Sonic is holding what looks to be a cartridge with Dr. Robotnik on it. He gives the player a thumbs down and has a frown on his face. The words are a warning that piracy is a serious crime. The music is sped up and then just ends. A new message appears on screen. What are you doing here? And then. You shouldn't be here. The sound swells and Sonic's eyes go completely black. I felt this was the best to start with for a very simple reason. It's not really believable. Even that first anti-piracy screen wasn't real. These were mock-ups or just iterations on that first video. Creepy and fun, but not real. The Sonic one is semi-believable until the ending. The ending feels like it's straight out of a creepy pasta. That's kind of the vibe a lot of these give off, and that's honestly amazing. It's like for a brief moment in 2020, the internet brought back gaming greedy pastas, this time mainly in a video format. Moving on, there's also this Mario Kart DS anti-piracy screen. This one follows the same trend of starting out normally. It takes a second for the game to realize it's pirated. The map loads, the racer is picked, and then as they load in, the camera is devoured by some creature. Mario is then loaded into a strange track. There's a monster cart at the end of the track, and he chases Mario. No matter how fast Mario drives, he cannot escape. He is devoured in the end, and the game corrupts. Another Mario piracy screen, and this time it's in Super Mario Galaxy. The game loads in, and immediately the player is told that piracy is wrong. The game then proceeds to leave Mario stranded on an island as a black hole slowly envelops him. After dying, the screen loads back into a normal looking world. Mario grabs the star and then is sent to this black void. Here he is given a message that piracy is a serious crime. A pop-up question appears that asks if he purchased the game. The only options are no and maybe. The game then saves and Rosalina tells Mario that he lied and that criminals don't get power stars. The Lumas say that they don't like criminals and that there's nothing he can do since he didn't buy the game. The game proceeds to send Mario through the black hole over and over again until he has no lives left. The game over screen appears. The player is told to return the stolen software now. The only options are okay and okay. Clicking either brings up a message that says goodbye, before giving an error code and crushing the game. If the player tries to reset the software, they get a message on screen with the music playing in reverse. There is nothing you can do. This anti-piracy screen feels very much like a creepypasta, similar to how the earlier Sonic one did. It gives off the vibe of doing something you're not supposed to do, which is kind of the point of these anti-piracy messages. Moving back to the DS, there's a Nintendogs anti-piracy message. This one is rather dark. You get to play the game for a little while. You get a dog, name it, and even get to play with it for a bit. Then comes a message saying that your dog is sick. This follows with a few minutes of continuing the game before another message appears on screen. Your dog has died. Nintendogs can only survive in legitimate Nintendo DS cartridges. This is messed up, but then it takes you to the grave of your dog. Honestly, if I ever saw this as a kid, I'd never play Nintendogs again. 
It's such a morbid idea, but one that I'm sure many of us thought of when we tried to imagine the worst thing they could do in Nintendogs. There's a Luigi's Mansion anti-piracy screen that uses an unused promotional screen of Luigi looking like he is possessed. This was thought for a long time to be the beta game over screen, but that wasn't the case. Either way, the screen is pretty terrifying, with Luigi looking dead and some dark music joining the scene. The usual message is at the top letting us know that it is a serious crime to pirate video games. I kind of like the dark side of this one. It used something that people couldn't find in the game, but I'd heard was in the beta to its advantage. Honestly, another screen that would have put me off gaming if I'd found it when I was younger. There's a Mario Kart Wii anti-piracy that traps Mario behind bars. This only lasts for a few minutes before the floating Wario head appears behind him. The head floats there in a jittery manner before a swamp smashes into Mario. Minecraft has an anti-piracy screen too. This one traps the player as they start their world. Signs will be placed in front of them explaining that the game knows that it's a pirated copy. Then creepers show up and kill the player. They are met with a message that says to go to the title screen or unlock the full game. They are then taken back to the title screen. They see a red mine with a message stating, you are a pirate. It wasn't just games that were getting these anti-piracy screens either. There were also consoles themselves. There was one for the GameCube. It tells them the usual about the game being stolen and then loads into a screen telling them that stealing games is a serious crime. The original Xbox also got one, but I'll just let this one play out for you. There's honestly mostly Nintendo themed anti piracy screens. The reason behind this is likely the same reason so many gaming creepypastas focus on the same topics nostalgia. There's a nostalgic horror to seeing these errors and anti-piracy screens in our favorite childhood games. You can just place yourself back in the shoes of your younger self and imagine finding these screens. We'd all be telling our friends on the playground the next day about the scary screen we'd found. It was something that really gripped the internet for a moment, which is why so many of these screens exist. They play on the fear of childhood corruption, the same way that many of the internet's nostalgic horror does. The final one I want to show before moving on to the next topic I want to discuss is this Donkey Kong Country 3 anti-piracy screen. I'll just play it for you first. Now, that face at the end is pretty creepy, but it's not the reason I wanted to show you the screen. I think it's one of the creepier screens, no doubt. But the reason is because of the first part of the video. The screen that you're looking at is the actual anti-piracy screen. Yes, yeah, some of these ominous warnings and messages actually existed. The normal anti-piracy version doesn't include the ending or any of the effects. It uses the game over screen from the game, which has these two in jail. It has ominous music, but it was never really intended to be scary, or at least it probably wasn't intentional. There are tons of anti-piracy measures that can be considered creepy that actually exist. 
This one is one of the more interesting ones simply because it relates to the not real ones. It serves as a bridge that brings us into the creepy anti-piracy screens. The first few methods of anti-piracy created by companies in the 80s and 90s included lens lock, code wheels, and special instructions found in the game's manual. Starting with lens lock, they were these plastic lenses that you would have to hold up to your screen in order to code a message. The game would scramble the message, with the lens lock being the only way to unscramble it. The lens lock proved to be so cumbersome by players that it was removed not long after. In fact, it only shipped with very few games. Those included Ace, Elite, Moon Cresta, and a few more. Most of these names you probably don't even recognize, likely because they were old games released on the Commodore 64. The next option for anti-piracy were the game manuals. Usually games would have a section where you'd have to answer a question or find a specific word that can only be found in the game's manual. This would then unlock the rest of the game. This was also found to be cumbersome, especially if someone lost the manual or bought the game used. This system was then replaced by the code wheel. The code wheel was this monstrosity of a thing that came with certain games. The code wheel, it turned out, wasn't very effective and many games went back to using the manual. There were lots of games that had various anti-piracy measures, but each game handled the messages differently. Let's look at some real uses of anti-piracy in video games. One of the most popular games of all time is The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. This is a game I've beaten a number of times throughout my life. The anti-piracy for this game is kind of cruel. You can actually play through the entire game. You can beat every boss, conquer every dungeon, and your journey will be mostly smooth. Until the end of the game. After you beat Ganon, you have to escape the castle as it's crumbling. You escort Zelda out, and she opens the doors for you so you can continue your escape. Eventually you'll find a door that can't be opened. Zelda does the animation and leaves without you. Link, and thus the player, is left in the collapsing building with no way of escaping, meaning you can never complete the game. There's a bit of a morbid side to this as well. The player is trapped in the castle, forced to live out the remaining minutes with the sounds of its destruction. Essentially the game is leaving Link in a purgatory where he can never complete his quest. A game with a rather aggressive anti-piracy method was Serious Sam 3. The Serious Sam games are kind of the opposite of their title. They're pure fun with wacky and not realistic gunplay. If you have a pirated version of the game though, something kind of terrifying follows you around. There's this unkillable scorpion creature that chases you around the game. You can shoot it all you want, but it'll never stop. This thing is such a juxtaposition to the entirety of the game, it really makes it stand out. It's especially scary for those with arachnophobia. Point and click adventure games are actually pretty well known for their anti-piracy screens. King's Quest VI puts you in jail in game for being a pirate. The most notorious one, though, happens in a game called Gold Rush. Gold Rush used the manual method for anti-piracy. At a certain point in the game, you are required to solve a puzzle using the game's manual. The puzzle is a trivia question that the game tells you where to find the answers for. If you get it wrong, well, this happens. The game murders the player for the crime of pirating a video game, though you could also get this screen for just inputting the wrong answers a few times. This is probably one of the bleakest anti-piracy screens, though it was probably supposed to be humorous, especially with the happy music continuing to play in the background. There are many more anti-piracy measures used over the last few decades. There's one for GTA 4 that has the game put you in permanent drunk mode. Also every car you get in flies at max speed and blows up over a short period of time. Game Dev Tycoon made it so that pirates would make it impossible for you to make any money off your games, which is a pretty funny meta interaction. Mirror's Edge is a game all about parkour and speed. Well, if you pirate it, you lose the ability to run when you go for your first jump. Your character runs for the platform before crawling to a slow walking speed. This makes it impossible to clear the jump. One of the most effective anti-piracy measures can be found in Earthbound for the SNES. If the game detects that it's being copied, then it'll throw more enemies on screen for you to deal with. Usually the amount is so high that it can lag the frame rate. There's also the ending, where you can go to fight the final boss, Gygus. Once he goes to his second phase, the game will freeze. When you load back in, you will find that your game file has been deleted. The rabbit hole of anti-piracy in games is a rather new one. 
The amount of screens that people are creating or finding is pretty incredible. There's so many games that wanted to punish those that stole their games. Even going so far as to scare the player. The fake anti-piracy screen phenomena has slowed down, but I'd found one as recent as six months ago, so it's not quite done yet. With more to talk about, it's likely I'll come back to this topic, if that interests you. Let me know in the comments section, and maybe we'll return to the world of anti-piracy screens. Thanks everyone for watching the video. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters, Victor Estrada, Blow and O's, Icy Dice, Ryoma, Bazingle, Nora Kingsley, and Hampter. The world is full of rabbit holes for us to explore. Some are deeper than others. Yet, some hide secrets just waiting to be uncovered. This has been The Darkest Rabbit Holes Volume 2. Thanks for watching everyone, and have a good night.